Yeah, so my name is Josh, CEO and co-founder of Gusto. Um, we started the company about five years ago, and what we do is we help today 40,000 companies, small businesses around the country with their payroll, their health insurance, their HR needs. We call it the people platform, but our mission is to serve. So again, thank you for the customers in the audience. And uh, yeah, we'll dive deep a lot more into my background. Uh, suffice to say, a lot of our inspiration was our own pain, running prior companies, having family run small businesses, and realizing that there was a lot of unnecessary pain that we thought we could help make a, make a difference with. Cool, so like, first of all, why the heck are you out here? You came in this awesome here? RV, which is wrapped, and it looks super awesome. So how'd you come up with that idea of taking an RV, like that's crazy, 11 cities around the world, we're the third. Yeah. Tell us where you've been and the whole idea behind the trip. Yeah, so we're calling this uh, Small Business Road Trip. Uh, it's all about the extra mile that small businesses go to to help their customers, to build their teams. Uh, oftentimes, it's a labor of love. No one makes someone start a business, so it really is an inspiration to work with this customer segment. And uh, what happened was last year, I was doing a shadowing program with my team where I go around, and Gusto today is about 430 people. And so uh, we're at the stage where I can't be involved in every person's onboarding. I can't spend time with each person every day. And so I do a shadowing program. And I realized that as much as I like shadowing my team, I also wanted to shadow customers. And so there was that as one idea. And then the second one was that we wanted to celebrate these companies who go the extra mile. So we created this award called the Extra Mile Award. Um, we thought about companies in these 11 cities that uh, really do uh, extra things with their team, are very thoughtful in how they take care of their teams. So we give them uh, $1,500 to donate to charity of their choice. And then rather than do it virtually, um, we are driving across the country in an RV, basically going from San Francisco to Florida, and along the way, basically meeting companies as much as possible. So. All right, terrific. So how did you choose the 11 cities? Um, so part of it was uh, geographic constraints. We didn't want to do more than six hours of driving a day from a security and safety standpoint. Uh, it is my first time in an RV. It's been awesome. Great place to sleep. Got woken up this morning by birds chirping outside. So <laughs> it's been pretty fun. I did a lot of camping growing up, so it hasn't been that different. It feels like glamorous camping, actually, compared to kind of being on the ground. Um, and then the cities, uh, you know, we had this route that we picked out. We looked at you know, specific places where we had lots of customers. We wanted to get off the beaten path. One of the goals I, I didn't mention earlier, um, we're based in Silicon Valley. Uh, that's our uh, origin point. We also have an amazing team in Denver. And we think about the two cities as kind of our home bases. Um, but I talk a lot about how Silicon Valley can be an echo chamber at times where it's easy to kind of just be there and feel disconnected. So part of the goal of the trip is to go to places that are different, unique, have their own flavor. And so beyond excited to be here in Phoenix. Awesome, cool. So can you tell us a little bit about, you're, you're giving out this award, the Extra Mile Award, uh, and I don't know if you can share about any of the other cities, but I know that you've given three awards out already. Yeah. Can you talk, are you allowed to talk about a little bit more about like what your favorite, like what's your favorite company that you're giving an award to? Like what are they doing? Or like, yeah. what are some little, what, because these tips can be shared with everyone yeah. about what people are doing to make the experiences on their team better. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, Every one of our customers is my favorite company, so I don't have favorites. They're all companies that we're honored to help. Um, but like I can tell you, just to tell their children. I can tell you about some of the companies we met recently. So, here in Phoenix, we just came from this morning a visit to a company called Insect Tech. They're a pest control company. Um, husband and wife pairing. They started the company four years ago. Um, and some of the cool things they do, they'd never come from this industry before. They had kind of been in larger companies previously. They wanted to start a small business, kind of control their destiny. But a lot of the innovations they've had are just them thinking about it with a fresh perspective. So they were describing how oftentimes um, you would have a window of time whenever you do pest control where you have to be at home waiting for someone to come. They thought that didn't make sense. Early on, they didn't have enough customers anyways, so they would just always be there at the exact time they said they would be there. So they've kept that tradition. So sometimes things that work well when you're really small can scale if you really have this really strong customer service mindset. Another thing that they did was around how they build their team. So. Again, I think a lot of times in corporate environments, things can become very rules-based. And so they were talking about um, one of their technicians who was often late to the first um, visit he would have. And they found out it's because he's a single father, he has a child that has to get taken to daycare. So they just said, well, we'll make it flexible, give you that time off, adjust the schedule for you to work around your time. And that person said, you know, 
they've never been treated this way before, or they've never had a manager like this before. I think it's a good example of how small business in particular can differentiate from big companies by being more focused on the people side. Very cool. So tell us a little bit about your your younger days. Like when did you were you did you always know you were gonna be an entrepreneur? Did you have those entrepreneurial tendencies early on? Did you have a lemonade stand? What what did that look like? Well, so when I was, I don't know, five or six years old, I wrote this manifesto about how I wanted to build a payroll company. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you thought I was serious. Every child with dreams. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I'll give you more about my background. So I was born in San Francisco. Uh, my parents were not from there. My dad's from a small steel town outside of Pittsburgh. Um, his whole family worked in the factories there growing up. My mom is from a small, or rather, large city in a small country called Bolivia. She came to the U.S. when she was 18 to study and go to college in San Francisco. Uh, and they were both the first in their families to go to college. So I draw a lot of inspiration from them in terms of uh, this idea of, and many small businesses I think can relate, just not accepting the status quo as the way things should be, thinking about how it could be and, and doing something about it. So they're not techie at all. They're both teachers. My dad taught high school um, special ed, English, history. My mom taught Spanish and French. So I got interested in software kind of when I was in uh, middle school, high school. It was fun to build websites. Um, I see engineering as this language for how to fix problems. And so that's what drew me to engineering. I uh, went to Stanford, studied electrical engineering. Uh, again, an environment where I could learn more about this thing called a tech startup and kind of how you use technology to solve problems. The two together is a pretty amazing combo. Uh, it's also where I met my co-founders. And so those are some of the things that got me inspired early on. And then if any of you guys ever do come out to the Bay Area, um, I'm a huge hiker, Boy Scout, Eagle Scout. So if you ever want some hiking tips out in the Bay Area, I'm happy to give you some tips. Awesome. So um, is Gusto your first company or? Yep. No. Nope. Okay. Let's yeah. talk, let's hear about it. Let's hear about the... The full journey. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'll go back to basically when I graduated. I joined a company, worked there for a few years. Um, it was my first time kind of learning about how to build product. I was a product manager. But my first company that I started was actually right after that in 2008. And uh, I describe it as a two-year kind of reactive chapter. It was a company that was building products for the Facebook ecosystem. So ways for companies to tap into this new exciting environment where you could do stuff in social media. But the reason why I, in retrospect, describe it as a reactive chapter is we really weren't sure what we were trying to fix. We just were making thousands of dollars a day in ad revenue, and so we were just it like, let's optimize. Too bad to me. No, it sounds <laughs> not too bad, except that then you wonder where does this go and what is its purpose? How do you build a team? How do you hire if it's really unclear what the value is you're bringing someone? Um, so we became optimizers, which is interesting in the short term. How do you optimize to do something more? But what was missing was the mission around what is this problem and what does this look like in 10, 20, 30 years? And so I learned a lot from that chapter um, in then affecting building Gusto, not least of which that was the company where I had run payroll, was frustrated, didn't think it was the way it should be done, and then um, drove us into this industry where we said, hey, maybe we can do it a lot better. Very cool. So what was, like, what was that first step of building then Zen Payroll? And we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, how did you even find your co-founders and begin working through that idea? Yeah, so two co-founders, uh, like I said, we're all electrical engineering, um, but not really, have not spent as much time doing engineering since graduating, uh, except for my co-founder, Eddie, who leads our engineering team. Um, all of us had had these prior chapters where we had used other products, so we'd all basically felt the pain and frustration of a lot of other um, kind of issues with payroll, health insurance, a lot of these cumbersome things that we felt could be much, much simpler. And then we each had family that had run small business as well. And so that was the inspiration. Now, what did we start doing? Um, well, we were working out of our house uh, that Tomer and I lived in, in Palo Alto. We used the upstairs bedroom as our workspace. And all that mattered early on was seeing if we could build a system that could go effectively file taxes and do uh, payment processing, right? So uh, that was our entire focus. Um, in that time period, Eddie, our third co-founder, was living in San Francisco. Palo Alto is about an hour away from San Francisco, so Eddie actually ended up living in our closet for six months. Uh, true story. He actually, um, the closet had a, fit a queen bed and had a skylight, so it wasn't like a Harry Potter closet. It was a nice big closet. I think most places in San Francisco are very closet-like to begin with, so yeah. I think he had it pretty good. I think, yeah, I think he was in a good place. 
But um, all that mattered early on, and we'll talk about, I think, YC, Y Combinator in a bit, but YC has a great saying, which is early on in a company, all that really matters is talking to customers and building products. And I think that translates, even if you're not a software company, right? All that really matters is learning about the pain point, the customer you're talking to, and then um, creating something that's valuable to them. And if you can't do that, then you don't have a company. So that's pretty much all we spend time on early in the journey. Awesome. So you are an electrical engineering major. How do you feel like, I mean, that's the furthest thing from payroll that I can think of. Um, but I, you, I can connect with that. Uh, so, and, and you can help me do that here in a second. But uh, what, what are the things that you think are a strength of that major that helped get you into this focus? I mean, obviously, you're coming into it as an outsider, so you're thinking about it much differently than someone who might have been very deeply ingrained in it. And then on the other side, it's very highly regulated. So how did you get yourself up to speed, get your co-founders up to speed on how to tackle this in the best way? Yeah, so I'll go in reverse order. I'll start with the last question. Um, in our space in particular, you know, compliance is something that has to be taken very, very seriously. It's an honor, a privilege for us to have this responsibility. Um, so we, we take it seriously. There's no beta, there's no pilot. The product has to work right from day one. It took us a year and a half before we launched because we wanted to make sure that the product would work right from day one. And so um, that's our job. We are always uh, paranoid. We always um, hire ahead. We always think ahead and make sure that now that we're processing tens of billions of dollars through Gusto, now that we're going to be paying you know 1% plus of all companies in America this year, um, that's a big privilege for us. It's a big responsibility. And so the uh, unique thing, though, which hopefully is a lesson for entrepreneurs in the room, um, you always want to take compliance seriously. But when it comes to how you think about the problem, um, most of the people at Gusto don't have any experience working in this industry. right? So 430 people, most of us have never been in the payroll HR benefits industry. Compliance team has, but the benefit of that is we can actually take a fresh perspective. We're not here to build ADP 2.0. We have a different view of what we think that future looks like. And so my best metaphor for that is if you um, ask people, you know, 125 years ago what they uh, wanted, they would have said they wanted faster horses, right? In reality, they wanted to move faster and someone had to invent a car to actually show them what's possible. So there's a unique balance there when you do talk to customers to both learn from them, but not always do whatever they ask, because then you're just building an incremental, faster, better, cheaper version of what already exists. You actually need to have a leap of faith where you believe there's something different some bigger step forward. And then you need to, along the way, prove that and have feedback to show that you're actually making a bigger impact. Um, there's this great, so you brought up a great quote about if you would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Yeah. Um, David, are you familiar with David Cancel yeah. from HubSpot? So he uses that same analogy. And I think this ties in really well with how you de decided to move your product. But um, it's the whole idea of there's a lot of people, especially in, in product management, yeah. that say that like sometimes we're the ones that know what's best for the customer without kind of being in their own vacuum and without asking. And instead, so the rest of the story goes with Ford, that GM took, yeah. completely took over their market yeah. because they weren't listening. And so what GM found is not that people wanted faster horses, but that they wanted better payment options, more types of vehicles and all of these things. And that's what they produced. And that's how they were able to take over the market. Yeah. And so that's very similar to uh, Gusto's model, I think, of not being in a vacuum, getting out as a CEO, talking to your customers. So um, what so far has kind of been the, the most surprising thing that you've learned from this journey? And I know you're ju yeah. you just, I don't know, I'm sure yeah. like City 11, you're, it's going to be like way better stories, but like what have you learned so far? No, no, it's been amazing for the last few days. And I'll go back to the double E question too. I want to make sure I, yeah, yeah. Uh, to some of the students in the audience, give some advice on major. Um, some of the things we've learned, it's been really interesting to meet a lot of employees uh, across uh, the last few cities. We and I wear a lot of Gusto swag, as you guys can tell. And so people see the shirt and go, hey, it's, it's Gusto. There's a lot of recognition. So um, interesting insights around can we do more for the employee um, who matters to us just as much as the employer, but in a lot of the historical products in our space was kind of left behind and not really a, a primary focus. Uh, and then in terms of the stories, I mean, they're just such cool stories. In San Luis Obispo, we met with a preschool um, started by a lady named Kim Love. It was in her house. Now it's in its own facility, 65 kids. Um, just a really thoughtful, deliberate approach to both building her teacher core and also building out the student population. 
in Pasadena. It was with a really cool agency that focuses on helping law firms become cooler and sexier. Seems almost impossible, but it's a big task. They're trying to bring technology to law firms to help modernize them. Um, but I was going to quickly mention some advice on the double E side. Um, I do think school, in particular, is uh, is a time to explore. And I think all of us, even later, can still come back to this mindset. There's no right or wrong path. Um, it's about figuring out what you enjoy, what you like. So for me, Double E was really more of a way to dive into really interesting problems, deconstruct these complex systems. I love math, so it was a lot of math. But I had as much fun in the Double E lab, which is usually in the basement. So there's a lot of good stories about being underground doing analog circuits labs. As I did going to the econ department, the IR department, um, to me it's more about these complex patterns. How do you do better onboarding? How do you design space to make it really interesting? How do you do pricing better? How do you build product better? Um, to me, those are all as interesting as engineering. So that's why I would not hire myself today as an engineer. I've been more focused on the broader puzzle pieces of how to build the business more holistically. So and then we uh, kind of talked about how did you apply for Y Combinator like pretty much as soon as you thought of the idea for Zen Payroll, or was that something that I don't know, how did you even decide to go to YC? I know there's a lot of things that go through founders' minds when they're first collecting their team about whether or not they'll go through an incubator model or if they'll just try it on their own or if they'll bootstrap or whatever that happens to be. So kind of just tell like there's a lot yeah. of really positive things I think that come out of YC. If you could just share your own experience and what, what are things that you weighed out in the beginning? Yeah, so my main advice to anyone that's thinking about incubators is to really, truly embrace the fact that um, you know, you're starting a company not because you want to be in an incubator, it's because you want to fix something, right? So it all starts with a problem. And incubators, accelerators, broader programs are icing on the cake. They can be tremendously valuable, but I've talked to founders that are sometimes like, if I get into YC, I'll start a company. And that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the point is to fix something that you're so obsessed with that you actually have to start a company to fix it. So in our case, um, we, uh, we did go through YC. I'd actually been there a few times as an investor previously, because I had sold my prior company. And when we talked to folks and got advice, um, everyone was very supportive, complimentary, said that it's an incredible community. And we decided that the value of that was worth joining and, and obviously giving up some equity because it is a, an equity investment. Um, so we're really proud to have gone through the program. We were in it during winter 2012. Uh, but my advice in general is, again, um, if you do want to go down that path, I can give you some more tactical advice. If not, it shouldn't be the thing that makes or breaks your business. It's ultimately up to you to decide how you want to build your organization. Yeah. So when you talk about the community, just just even in your own class, Winter 2012, can you shout out some of the other names of companies around that class? Why is he super impressive if you haven't, if you don't know a lot about them? Um, they're kind of like the, they're one of the very first incubators, and they moved from Boston to to San Francisco, and um, well, actually to Mount, Mountain View, right? Mountain View. Yeah. Um, they have an office in San Francisco now. Too. Okay, perfect. Um, but they are they have produced some really impressive companies. So if you like, yeah. just shout out the community that you are particularly a part of. So in our batch, there's companies like LendUp, which does um, kind of consumer financing for folks that. Uh, used to be kind of more caught up in payday loan cycle. It's an online product. It's much easier to use. Um, there's a company called PlanGrid that actually builds software for the construction industry. You can tell that I like non-sexy problems and products. Tracy is a super impressive founder. Yeah, so. Tracy is amazing. Um, but yeah, a variety of companies. And I mean, some succeed, some don't. Startups are hard. But the uh, probably bigger companies that have come out of YC are Dropbox, Airbnb, um, but there's also hundreds and hundreds that haven't succeeded. I mean, the main message I have for folks on startup land is, you know, be obsessed with the problem, try to make it work. It's not about purely the financial outcome. Most companies don't succeed. Um, it's about fixing something. And if you do that well, and you do it in a way you're proud of, you'll eventually build a company that is actually quite valuable. But that can't be the ultimate obsession because that'll ultimately lead you astray. Cool. So what was like the number one thing you took away from that experience at YC? Um, so YC is great in that it really reinforces the value of being scrappy. So everyone works out of their bedrooms or their houses during YC. Um, like I said, the only thing that we really focus on is building, in our case, writing code and talking to prospective customers. Um, so that was kind of the, the simplicity and elegance of it. The way the program is structured, every Tuesday you have a dinner, you have a speaker come in, you discuss a topic, try to learn. 
But the main value I found is in the community of other founders. There were 65 companies in our batch. And frankly, what has been created here at Galvanize is a great example of the same concept. Um, community is not just about companies that are partners with you or companies that can use your product. It's actually just this shared philosophy. I find uh, the camaraderie amongst entrepreneurs is really special. Many folks don't view it as a zero-sum game. And this is either in tech or non-tech, right? I'm just talking about small business in general. Um, I'm always amazed by the desire to help, uh, share advice, share wisdom amongst small businesses. Um, folks want to help each other out. Awesome. So now, now we're going down the path a little bit, and here's Zen Payroll. How did you decide to tune your name from Zen Payroll to Gusto? Yeah, so uh, the name actually was always a temporary name, Zen Payroll. We had a few days to choose it. It cost us eight, seven, eight dollars on GoDaddy. Maybe some of you have similar the way stories. To do it. <laughs> so it's kind of as simple as that. It wasn't very complicated. Um, we knew it was probably not going to be our long-term name because it was very limiting. Um, so we had a, a thought that we're going to change it at some point. Um, what we loved about the word gusto, it took us a bit of time to find it, is that we think about gusto, if we do our job right, is all about this vibrancy, this energy, this enthusiasm people have when they do work they love, they're good at, or when you start a company from scratch and are successful, like that's gusto. And so uh, my advice to anyone that is thinking about naming uh, I always describe names as vessels, right? It's not the thing that matters most. What matters most is serving your customer well. But it's a vessel, and you fill it with meaning by serving your customer well. And so Gusto is a better vessel for us. We like that uh, association with the energy, the vibrancy, the people component. Um, we still want to bring peace of mind to people, so we still like the Zen piece of our old name. You know, we want to make things easy, make sure you don't have to worry about taxes or insurance compliance. Um, but when you hire someone and they join your team, or when you pay someone, or when someone gets promoted, or um, some of these really special moments take place, that's what we're really honored to be a part of as well. We have Gusto.com now, which yes. is impressive, a five-letter domain name. Is there any good stories behind that? It was not $8. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. It was a tad bit higher than $8. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, we're going to be building Gusto for many, many decades. So it was a... Uh, a pretty easy decision to kind of make that investment. Um, and we'll talk about it a bit later, but I think there is a whole mindset here of what it takes to build a long-term company. And I think a lot of small businesses in particular can relate. Um, it's, it's a very great simplification. It's a great forcing function. When we make hiring decisions, we have to think about the long-term. When we do fundraising decisions, we think about the long-term. Um, we're going to be doing this for a long time. And you know, when I'm 90 years old, I really couldn't care less if my name is associated with it. I'm not doing it because I get attention. It's just really fun to fix something and have folks say thank you. And uh, that's where we derive a lot of our joy. Awesome. So how did you decide to go after small business? What was like the guttural feeling of like, I have to help these people? Um, what was that turning point? Do you remember what that was? Um, so both in our own experience, uh, we most felt connected to small business because of, of family. So my co-founder, Eddie, his mom runs a small doctor's office in LA. Um, she had done payroll by hand for a long time. He had grown up with, you know, like most small business, it's a family business, so he had helped out in the office uh, quite a bit. Uh, my other co-founder, Tomer, he's from Israel. His uh, father runs a two-person men's clothing store. He had also helped out quite a bit growing up in that business. And my mother-in-law actually runs uh, payroll in uh, Silicon Valley. So um, we got really excited about small business because it's a large, large market, and it's in the most amount of pain, in our opinion. Um, doesn't mean bigger companies are not in pain too. We get asked by a lot of bigger companies, can they use Gusto? And we have this fun interaction where we say, it's not you, it's me. And we say, we'll help you eventually, we'll, we'll get to you. But right now our focus is primarily on this one to 100 employee segment. It's about a third of the US workforce, so it's a gigantic market. And it's a segment that historically didn't have access to high quality software. It was very uh, hard to sell to this audience. And we don't have a high-touch outbound sales team. It doesn't work at this uh, revenue per customer size. It's all inbound. So word of mouth is how we grow, um, contributing good content, creating guides for how to make your employee handbook, but really just having a great experience. Today, our NPS, which stands for Net Promoter Score, is over 70, which we're really proud of. Ooh, that's, that's a awesome. sign of folks referring Gusto to someone else. Yeah, like ap Apple's at like 80 or something like that, but it's very it's very hard to achieve a score yeah. even above like double digits. So yeah, no, we anything even above 30, 40 is pretty amazing, and so we're honored to have it, and we have to keep earning the right to keep it. All right, terrific. So 
now we're kind of like we're going down the the, the route of starting uh, Gusto. Um, what are some of the things that you did? Like, what's advice you can give to people just starting companies? What are the things that are right at your foundation? And I, I know that like you're a big core values guy, so yeah. I know that that probably will tie into a lot of this. But um, how did you decide like the vision for your company to get everyone on board? Because getting those for, like in a startup, it's really hard, especially when you're attacking this particular industry. Uh, how do you entice people to join and get get some momentum going in your company? Yeah, so you hit the nail on the head. There's two really important topics here. It's obviously about finding a problem you care about and it being now a problem you believe you can fix. So there has to be some hypothesis on how your solution could be better and different than what's out there today. Otherwise, you're not helping. And so uh, we spent a lot of time there, but then it's very iterative, building, building, building. But what you're speaking to is the second part, which is um, equally important in my opinion, and it's the how, right? We have this due north, this vision of what we think uh, the people platform should be for every company everywhere in the world. And we're going to get there eventually. It'll take us a long time. But how we accomplish that goal matters just as much. And so uh, that's something that actually is very personal. It kind of comes back to why you're starting a business in the first place. And not every company, by the way, has to scale up. In our case, our opportunity and our passion is about fixing it for lots of people. This is just as beautiful and amazing in a small company that never wants to get past 10 employees. Um, but this part of it is actually really valuable because this is actually the day-to-day, -day, right? This is, you know, what are your core values? What is your philosophy? What do you stand for? If you're making a hiring decision, what do you filter against? So for Gusto, we always have had three core parts of our hiring process, which is where this most manifests. Uh, number one is aligned values. And I'll talk about that in a sec. Number two is aligned motivations. And number three is, is shared and aligned skill set. And I think a lot of times people just go to the third one, which is what is our need and can this person fill it? I want someone to do this, let's have them do it. These first two, values and motivation, are actually where we spent most of our time. And I used to do this interview with every candidate, so I made every one of the first 50, 60 offers in the company. Um, that doesn't scale, so now I do a training program with other folks that do the same type of interview. Um, but every person coming through has an interview that's focused around kind of what drives you, what inspires you. Um, when you're in a specific situation where you have a debate or a disagreement, how do you deal with that? And when you're in a stressful situation, something is very intense, uh, what makes you want to rise to the occasion? And we have a set of philosophies at Gusto around being very service-centric, having no ego, um, wanting to think for the long term, and we look for those traits in the people that we talk to. Um, by all means, there are many different ways to approach this. Don't look at ours as the playbook. My encouragement to all founders is to take the time and think about like, why did you start your business? What got you going in the first place? And uh, as you think about hiring, what are those four, five, six things that are going to guide that process? So we created our six values when we were just three people because we we're hiring our first employee. And we wanted to figure out how to maintain that dynamic as we got bigger and bigger. Um, I think a lot of times people come back to that much, much later in the process. Um, and there are no, again, right or wrong values. It's just about being authentic, being introspective, and then being opinionated. I think a lot of companies end up trying to think it's more of a, a wash. Um, you have to stand for something, otherwise you don't stand for anything. So starting a company is not always easy. What were like the rock bottom days when you thought you were going to throw in the towel and be done with this whole entrepreneurship thing? Um, so rock bottom. I mean, I feel so honored to be doing this. It's hard to... <laughs> To be clear, there's lots of ups and downs, but I, I guess maybe I'll share my mindset if that's helpful to folks. Um, yeah, I think it's super important because yeah. I think everyone, it's in, everyone experiences ups and downs and a lot of downs, and <laughs> I think um, it's really important that everyone knows that everyone does go through it, and there are yeah. certain things that can help pull you out. So, so I'll get, I thought of an example that definitely was frustrating and then we used our values to fix it but uh, in our first year year and a half of operating we were working with the bank um, as our ACH provider so that's how we do direct deposit and it was Christmas Day and uh, they hadn't told us that they shut down for the first part of Christmas Day so basically people's paychecks were not coming on Christmas Day when they were expected and we got notified of that like halfway into Christmas Day um, which is kind of terrifying because as a payroll company, that's one of the very few things we always have to do, right, is get paid on time. And so we ended up basically doing wire transfers manually to like several hundred people um, and eating the cost of that. And uh, the reason was it just made sense. That was what was the right thing to do. That's one of our values. We're going to do it that way. And uh, people are very appreciative. They did get paid on time. 
Uh, the bank definitely was apologetic because it was their fault <laughs> and um, ended up uh, making us whole. We didn't even have to pay for those wire transfers afterwards. But um, yeah, just getting the phone call, getting the email, kind of the whole team coming together, even when we were just 30, 40 people uh, during that holiday season was pretty special. What's involved in that? Because I think there's a lot, I mean, I have been involved in companies where there's always like end of month, like sales rush and things like that, but there's never like that Christmas day, like yeah. everybody's in the office, everyone's heads down helping. So how did you kind of rally everyone around that movement? Um, so I think it, it comes back to the way you hire. So service mindset, you know, that, that second pillar I mentioned, so values, motivation, skill. We've tried to hire people that when we talk about the problems we're fixing, which is about making it easier for small businesses to succeed, making it easier to build this connection between employers and employees, um, people get really, really excited about that. And so then as a result, I'm not there to convince them that small businesses matter. I never have to motivate them to be excited about this audience. They joined Gusto because they were already excited about this audience. So I think that's, again, why a lot of these topics around culture and values come back to hiring and making sure that it's not just about skill, it's also about the values motivation fit, because later on it makes life much easier. Very specifically, how do you reinforce that, especially because how many employees are you at Custom now? About 425. 425. So like, it's definitely, you're well beyond being able to interview every single person. You stopped at, what was that point when you're like, I can't interview any more people. I need to step back and take well, my hands off. I still want to interview every person, yes. <laughs> but yeah. I know it's not possible. So, um, no, it's no logic. Just, I want to trust my teammates, give them that ability. So around 50, 60, I stopped interviewing. Then I knew that there was these three or four people that should always be in involved yeah. in every interview that would do something very similar to me. And then when we got to about 150, we had to create a whole program. We call it the Watermelon Program. It's uh, basically a set of people that are nominated uh, to this program from Gusto. Um, they have to love interviewing, be good at it, be interested in this topic of motivation and value system. I do a half-day training with them uh, every six months. And then every person coming through Gusto does a watermelon interview. And the word why watermelon wanna... is just an inside yeah. joke. I was like, why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the traditions in companies, I think, are always, they always have to feel authentic. So um, we hired our first employee, actually. We were living in that house in Palo Alto. And our landlord had given us a watermelon that morning. So we gave it to him. So all people joining Gusto now get watermelons. Wow. And then our Wi-Fi network is called Watermelon. And that program is called Watermelon. So again, there doesn't have to be a lot of logic to it. It can just be something that feels right. For some people, the pineapple is a symbol of hospitality, but it's a watermelon. That's so great. Watermelons are also green. You know, we do stuff related to money, so it kind of fits. Love it, love it, cool. So um, now I'm just gonna ask you like 21 questions rapid fire. These are always really fun, um, if I can find my sheet here. Yes. Um, and then we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A. So please be thinking about uh, what you want to ask and uh, get that started. So, all right, here we go. Ready? Let's do it. All right, cats or dogs? Dogs. Okay, beer or wine? I don't drink. Okay, sushi or tacos? Sushi. Coke or Pepsi? I don't drink soda. Great. <laughs> Water. <laughs> Favorite app? Say it again. Favorite app? Uh, Favorite app? Um, I'll go with Calm, it's a meditation app. Cool, I actually, so I played around with that. I was at Launch Festival and I think Jason's an investor in that, yeah. so that's very cool. Anyways, um, favorite holiday? Um, employee Appreciation Day. That was a Gusto plug, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a and cool day, it's day actually not created by Gusto. Um, it changes every year, but uh, on the last Employee Appreciation Day, How we actually went. It's a national holiday. Oh, it is a national holiday. Okay. We didn't create it, oh, okay. but we want to create more attention for it. If you guys can look it up, um, team in the back, I'll, I'll share with you guys the actual date. But it's a it's a special we'll, day. We'll go back there if you just want to shout out, shout out time now. So your favorite OS? Um, Mac. Your favorite car? Uh, my Honda Accord of 2003. Um, my first car is still my car. <laughs> I don't love that RV out there. <laughs> the RV is pretty sweet. We, we rented it though, so I can't That's claim perfect. it as our car. Perfect. Um, your favorite vacation spot? Anywhere where my wife is. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, you're, um, and she's also an E major too, which is very yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. She was a double E at MIT. Um, and then uh, your favorite book? Uh, recently, Sapiens. It's a okay. pretty cool book about the kind of evolution of our species. Oh, wow. Um, your favorite movie or TV show? 
movie, Lion King. All uh, right. TV show. I don't really watch TV too much. Game of Thrones. All right. Yeah. Your favorite artist, music, music-wise. Uh, honestly, anything with a good beat. What is bumping on that R&B? That's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, we've gotten some pretty good playlists going. We actually are open to suggestions as well. So if you guys have recommendations for uh, like the six-hour drive we'll be doing later today, just let us know. <laughs> All right, your go-to karaoke song. Um, something with bon John Bon Jovi. Yes. Yeah. Um, anything you collect? Uh, hopefully memories. Love it. Any unusual skills or talents? Um, well, I was a Boy Scout, so I like to make fire, but I'm not a pyromaniac. So <laughs> safe fires. But we'll be making some fires, hopefully campfires along the way on the road. So if it's the end of the world, you make a fire, Josh, you're back. Um, and then, uh, any, what's your top skill in business? Um, hopefully reading people. I've done several thousand interviews now with candidates over the last few years, and it's really fun. Each person is different unique, but I love understanding them as a person. What profession other than your own would you try to attempt if you weren't the CEO of Gusto? Um, probably be like a nature tour guide. Very cool. Where, like, what, where would you want to be the nature tour guide of? I'd want to like change every year. I got married in New Zealand. That oh, was fun. Um, but anywhere outdoors is pretty awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Um, what's the best compliment anyone can give you? Uh, that I've helped them in some way. And is there a cause that you care about? <laughs> I feel like there's like, there's definitely there's a cause of Incusto, but other than the cause of, yeah. like, of helping people, what would be another? You know, I mean, I think there's, I'll, I'll give this something philosophical and then I'll give a plug for Gusto Giving, which is something that all of you guys can benefit from because it's um, in our product. But uh, I don't know, something that I really believe in is empowerment, giving people the chance to do stuff they love, they care about, pursue their dreams, kind of create a company, be successful, make a living doing something they love. That's kind of the set of business ideas, problems that I've always gravitated towards. Uh, and then in terms of Gusto Giving, people can actually donate directly from their paycheck to any charity they want through Gusto, if you weren't aware, and employers can match that, but it's always opt-in. Um, but there's a broader goal here to enable reoccurring donations because a lot of nonprofits end up getting their income in a very volatile way. So there could be a big campaign, but it makes budgeting really hard if you can relate as a business owner. Getting all your revenue in like one month is not really helpful. And so uh, our goal with Gusto Giving is actually to enable people to contribute five, 10, 20, whatever dollars you want to charities you care about. And then we take it directly out of your paycheck. And then we do the uh, documents, the payments, all of that's done behind the scenes. We don't make any money on that. Um, and so uh, kind of a cool program that hopefully you guys can benefit from or participate in. Uh, we want to get more awareness for it. That's super cool. And then I know that brought up another thing, obviously the extra mile tour. You got each small business owner that you're awarding, yeah. they get to the end, then give $1,500 yeah. to a charity of their choice. So what are, like, are there any charities that have already been delegated to or is that kind of to be announced? Yeah, so um, I'll give a plug too here. If you guys want to follow along, gusto.com slash roadtrip uh, as the route, and then gusto.com slash extra mile is the actual award recipients. And we have these amazing profiles, kind of expose, kind of giving uh, a lot more insight into these companies, including the organizations they're donating to. But the one I was just at this morning, they're donating to is a, a organization that works with Down syndrome children. And so they have a home, a training center, a school set up for folks um, who have that happen. Cool. All right, last question. Sorry, that wasn't very rapid fire. I kind of, I get curious and then I have to dive in. Um, what's one thing on your bucket list? Uh, one thing on my bucket list, um, there's a lot of things on my bucket list. Uh, I don't know. I, Let's do your a, a, short term, a short term one right now is literally in the next couple of days on the road trip. We're eager to go climb a mountain, have a campfire, kind of enjoy nature along the road. So that's that's a near term bucket list yeah. item. That's terrific. What are, what are some stops that you're... You already saw uh, jo Joshua Tree, right? Yeah. Um, is there any other big landmarks you're looking out for? I'm going to say the Grand Canyon. Um, probably no. not get to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and actually afterwards, if you guys have tips, you can share them with me. Um, we'll mostly be in the cities with the small businesses. But uh, the cool thing is like any stop along the road, um, any place that's selling souvenirs or has random like tobacco or random jerky or turkey jerky, like is a small business. So that's actually also why we're here. So. Um, just excited to see stuff. I've only been to two of the 11 cities in my life, so most of it's all very new for me. So we have this thing on the side of the road, and I'm horrible at directions, but it's called The Thing. 
and it is like one of those like road stop <laughs> it's worth going to uh, i don't know if it's worth going to but like they make you <laughs> feel really compelled to go and take a peek so it might be it might be fun for the team to go and, and check out what what, what is the thing I, don't, I can't tell you <laughs> Sounds <laughs> as long as they're a small business. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So now it's time for some Q and A. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand. All right. Perfect. All right. Stand up. Yeah. My question was around culture. So if your customers are happy, guessing that your clients and team are also happy. So. Yeah, great question. So I think there's a broader topic here about how you align serving the customer with serving the team and also ultimately building a, a business that can be around for a long time because if you don't build a sound business then you can't help your customer or your team. And I think ideally they're always working in sync. And what I mean by that is um, you know, when we serve our customer well, people feel really excited. They, you know, what makes them happy to be at Gusto? Yes, obviously it's being a part of a company that's growing. Uh, we want to pay them in a way that makes them feel appreciated. We want to give them equity so they can own a part of the company. We want them to enjoy the company they have with their teammates. We do meals with each other. But a big part of it is actually the success of serving our customer and them saying thank you. So they don't, they shouldn't be at odds with each other. They should actually be complimentary, in my opinion. Um, I think a lot of times when people join companies, they want to be themselves. They want to be more natural. Um, I think a lot of times people wear masks sometimes if they join a company, feel like they have to package themselves for one person versus the other. So at Gusto, our whole focus in the team side is about finding that alignment so that when you join, you can just be yourself. Um, but we have unique traditions, like uh, because we started in the house in Palo Alto and I was raised shoes off, our whole office uh, in both Denver and San Francisco is a shoes off office. So people take their shoes off at the door. We have these big shoe racks. You walk around in your socks or your slippers. It's a very unique thing. We don't expect all our customers to do it at all. Um, but I do think these traditions tend to be kind of organic in the way that they develop. Um, you don't want to be overly planned or strategic. It just has to feel right. Yeah. Hi, Josh. My name is Aaron, and I uh, customer of Gusto's and business Was it always like that? And how did you kind of come to that realization of that decide what the cost was for the cast off of the customers? Yeah, great question. So the uh, what I love about the subscription, if you guys weren't aware, um, for using Gusto you pay $39 a month and then $6 per employee per month. And uh, what the subscription does is it makes it very clean and clear that this is a partnership. Right, so you know we're taking in my head, you know, five of these twenty hats that a business owner has been wearing for a long time. We'll do all your tax filings, we'll do all your payment processing. If you're using us for health insurance, we do medical, dental, vision, workers' comp, life insurance, disability insurance, 401k. We want to take a lot of those things that were very complex with lots of paper and pencil and process and make it easier so you have more time. If we're doing that well, then our customers will pay us every month while we're doing it, and if we're not, they'll leave us. But the partnership is the fact that it could last forever. We could have a customer for the next 50 years, and that's amazing, as long as we keep doing our job right. How did you come up with the cost for that? Yeah. Let's maybe some research or anything, because yeah. I, I was looking around before I found yeah. Gusto. Yeah. Of course, there are prices all across the board. Yeah. How did you guys narrow in on what yours was? Because I'm looking to do a subscription model on different yeah. businesses, and yeah. I'm just wondering what the process was to try yeah. to figure that out. No, so the second part of the question was all about how did we choose pricing? Um, it's definitely earlier on, it was much more art than science. As we've gotten bigger, we spent a lot more time looking at the market, looking at where we get place. So it goes back to what you want to package your product as. For us, it's not about being the lowest price product. We can definitely be lower priced than ADP and paychecks because we're not doing all of these tasks behind the scenes by hand. We're using software, which is more accurate and more efficient. So we can pass on those cost savings to the customer. But we know that we're doing it in the most comprehensive way possible. So we don't want to be a cheap product. We think what's fair to our customer is to do something very comprehensive, very complex, make it very, very simple, 
And so that was the approach we took. The exact numbers, we just looked at a lot of different comparables. We looked at our margin structure. We looked at what we thought was fair in terms of giving back some of those cost savings to the customer. We thought a lot of that historical pricing was pretty uh, abusive and kind of very unpredictable. Um, you know, using Gusto, and this is something hopefully every subscription company does, it's very transparent. You go to our website, that $39 and six is everything. Um, in the past, you would pay more per W2 at the end of the year, more per state that you're in, more per specific tax filing status you want to have. We think it should be all at once, just a clean set of prices. Um, and that was the philosophy we took to it. Now, pricing and packaging is something companies should always build on muscle and become stronger at. Um, so we have people now dedicated to that. And the goal is to always not leave tons of money on the table, but also be uh, affordable to our customer because we know that they've been um, left alone for a long time. Yeah, great question. Um, and I'll try to make it more advice too for folks that are starting companies or working at small businesses. So uh, I think it's really important to understand the market. And so in our case, we made sure early on, like, you know, ADP, paychecks, what's the market share? How are things done? Because if one company has like 80% market share, then it's a very different way for you to be successful. You have to kind of win by them losing customers. What we realized in our case, both then and now, is that it's a massively fragmented market. So ADP and Paychex are the two largest companies in the space. They're worth 65, $70 billion, but they serve only about 20% um, of the companies, the employees um, in America. And so it's, uh, it's actually very, very fragmented. You have a lot of folks doing it still on pen and paper by hand, about 40% of companies in the US. And so we realized that the segment we were starting with, smaller business, um, both was being ignored, was doing it by hand, was getting penalized. A third of those companies every year in the US get fined for incorrectly doing their payroll taxes. And so we actually, the short answer is, didn't spend very much time and do not spend very much time today focusing on competitors. Um, our motivation doesn't come from competition. We are competitive in that we want to win, but I don't like, celebrate or thrive off the fact that ADP is not as good a product. I didn't build that product. If I'm going to complain about it, I should go make it better. So our focus is really just on what we control, which is our customer getting more of them and serving them well. I think it's a pitfall that Silicon Valley in particular falls into, which is comparison, where you can kind of feel better by comparing yourself to someone. All that matters is actually just serving the customer and building a sound business. So we have a team today that does look at things like pricing, um, that does look at you know um, different uh, strategies being employed. But for the most part, we just think about it from first principles, decide what makes sense, and go with it. And our instincts have been pretty good. That's pretty key as a side note to innovation. Um, if you get too caught up in comparison with benchmarking, then that's how you end up building a better, faster, cheaper version of what already exists. And incrementality is not a good way to build a successful company. Yeah, for sure. So in terms of uh, just understanding how we think about our product, we call it this people platform, but it's all about what you need to pay people, hire them, onboard them, enable them to go do great work. And we have more to do in that vein. Uh, we definitely support all types of, of job types. So it could be a contractor, full-time, part-time, exempt, non-exempt. We have lots of folks paying lots of different types of uh, work through Gusto today. Um, so that's, that's one point. Now in terms of innovation, I don't know, for me, like, impact is what is sexy. So like, fixing something that's broken and causes a lot of pain is really exciting. We're at a very unique point in the economy. Like, the entire economy flows through payroll. Or you have to earn money before you spend it. So we have no lack of opportunity in terms of things that we know we can make 
uh, better in the lives of our employers and employees. But for us, um, I guess in some ways, what you see on the website is what we are just very obsessed and focused on, which is you know, being that system that every company requires. Um, payroll is, is a really unique place to be in because it is the least optional part of the entire stack. Um, if you don't pay someone, they're going to quit pretty fast. And so it's kind of the thing you have to do from day one, and it gives us a chance to start building that very direct relationship. We're agnostic to payment rails. So whether it's using um, ACH, uh, debit rail, um, using any type of new payment network out there, people should get paid however they want to get paid. We're still the one enabling that, but we're not going to go build our own payment networks. My first what? Funding. Funding. Ah, uh, yes, we didn't talk too much about funding. so. Um, I can share a couple points of view. Gusto has raised about $175 million thus far, and uh, proud to have some great investors involved in the business. A um, couple things. Uh, first, and I'll get to your question, but just more philosophy first. So number one, uh, fundraising is the same as hiring, is the approach I would encourage all of you to think about. So it's not about just capital. It's about finding someone that aligns with your values, your philosophy, your motivation, your skill sets and actually can be valuable in that context. So our first set of investors were 20 CEOs and founders. Um, the CEO of Yelp, the CEO of Dropbox, the CEO of Stripe, the CEO of Evernote, CEO of Eventbrite, which invested capital into Gusto to help us get started. Um, so we chose individuals because we liked that they were operators. They were very biased towards action. And the cool part is that they didn't invest because they need to make a lot of money to pay for their kids' college tuition. They invested because they were really excited to fix this problem. And so it's a really cool way to vicariously be on the journey with us. And those two, three hour conversations are very leveraged because I can share advice with them, they can share advice with me, and we can help each other. Um, we have raised venture capital as well, um, but it's the same process. I think of fundraising as hiring. And then number two, uh, fundraising is not the goal. That's another big pitfall I think a lot of companies fall into. Fundraising is an enabler to go accomplish a goal. And I think it's great for you guys to not be in Silicon Valley, frankly, because it's an area that gets caught up in this in a very dangerous way. Um, you know, the goal is always to fix something, do it in a way you're proud of, build a sound business, have good gross margin, have effective customer acquisition cost. Funding can be helpful to collapse time. So if there's a way for us to go accomplish something faster, an example is that we spent a couple of years building out our health insurance services so folks can set up health insurance through Gusto. That was a 40, 50 person team entirely funded by our investor capital because we didn't have the cash flow yet to fund that. We were able to bring that service to market much faster as a result. So R&D is a good area to deploy cash. Um, I would argue anything else around acquisition, uh, especially if it's non-cost effective, it's just an easy way to burn capital pretty fast. Um, but that's a couple pieces of advice. And then we have VCs too, so Kleiner Perkins, General Catalyst. My favorite way to get to know an investor is to go hiking. So I usually take folks out walking, exploring. Um, again, it's two steps process. One is get to know them as a person. Um, average length of time I've known an investor before we work together is about three and a half years. I want to get to know them, get to know their family perhaps, understand what they care about. And then when we do a transaction, i.e. a financing, that's a two week process with someone I know already very, very well. Yeah. Um, so on the first question, would we be successful bootstrapping? Uh, I would like to think absolutely, because again, finding a problem, building a good product, the big difference would be time, right? So we were able to hire a bunch of engineers early on that I would not have been able to hire. So we would have taken us a lot longer to build out what we've created. It's pretty complicated to go do every tax rule across the whole country, you know, file hundreds of millions of documents, you know, through software and do it accurately. So it takes a lot of people on the engineering side to build that. Um, the reason why companies raise money is if it takes too long, someone else can do it faster than you, then the market can leave you behind. So I'm proud that we took investor capital because there was a time pressure. But again, uh, the decisions we made were the same decisions we would have made anyways. We were just able to do it faster. And we also got some great people involved that could give us advice. Uh, in terms of growth, um, I used to run our, our go-to-market teams. I joke my job is to keep firing myself from as many jobs as I can. So we have now great leaders running sales and marketing. Uh, 
the thing that we tap into the most is um, customer love. And it's basically not a separate ecosystem. Our entire funnel is inbound and organic. It's word of mouth driven. Um, I'll show you afterwards a map I was showing a few folks, but it shows the spread across the country. We're simply, I would argue, at the right time and at the right place for a problem that's been around for a while and can now finally be fixed the way it should be fixed. And so we don't really have a dependency on a partner the way um, Airbnb did on, on Craigslist, I guess, for initial customer acquisition. It's um, more just, again, this huge segment of companies that uh, we're doing it by hand, doing it on paper for a long time. And one piece of advice I can give there is to think about if you're creating a company, what trends that are happening that you can basically use to your advantage. So in our case, um, paperless, e-sign, e-file, e-fax, e-payment, and being cloud-based, were two things that, if you go back 10 years ago, were not very, very common. And when someone signs up on Gusto, many of you have gone through this, you're giving us very sensitive information, right? It's EINs, SSNs, bank numbers, routing numbers, and 10 days later, we might be debiting $5,000 from your account. So if you go back 10, 15 years ago, people did not trust web browsers enough to do that. But today, the web browser is fairly ubiquitous. People trust and think about things like Dropbox, Gmail, Facebook as pretty well-known products. And so we can leverage just that trust to say, here's who we are. Now, we're never going to take that trust for granted, but timing is in our, in our benefit. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I know you guys take a lot of pride in um, making sure that uh, your services are fully made for you. Uh, how are you navigating the uh, current healthcare changes with all the regulatory changes? And uh, secondly, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, so on the first point, uh, we just we take it very, very seriously. Uh, if anyone ever wants to call us, talk to us, to what you said, we're always going to be available. And then as soon as that call ends, we want to figure out how to prevent it from happening. And that applies to payroll, health insurance, any part of using Gusto. Now, uh, a lot of the changes happening in health insurance, we do track um, pretty thoroughly. Today, for those of you that don't know, we do small group health insurance. So that's basically us acting as a broker, setting you up with insurance um, very easily. That industry has been around for a while. A lot of what's changing with regulation is the individual exchange market, which was created through the ACA. Um, so we do track it, but small group is something that uh, we don't think will be changing dramatically. Um, but we do look at what's happening next, and our job is to make it work for you. So whether it's small group, large group, individual exchange, self-insurance, whether there's a broader shift to portable benefits with more of a focus on HSA, FSA, HRA type plans, um, we are building out a lot of those different experiences. Our goal is to be comprehensive. So um, that answers your question. We spend a lot of time looking at it. We try to build ahead. And uh, you know, part of why I was in DC is to start building more and more relationships with folks out there. Um, they're excited to have technology companies they can work with to make their ideas become more real. Uh, and the politics piece I try to avoid. And then in terms of uh, your second question, um, that was more focused again on... Uh, that was, how are you doing more areas that you're... Oh, states, yes. So we are very excited to bring health insurance to more areas. Very excited to be coming here um, sooner rather than later. We look at population. So uh, our initial health insurance market was California. Uh, we've since added several additional states. We're excited to be in the top you know, 10, 20 states that cover 80% of the US population in the next several months. So I don't have an exact date for you, um, but we're very excited about uh, being in this market. And once we go live, I mean, that's what takes time. I, I know you relate to it. We could have been here much faster. We could have had payroll much faster. It took us three and a half years to get to nationwide. There is simply no shortcut. You have to take the time, do it right, and um, we never want to sacrifice on quality of the service. All right, awesome. We have time for one more question, and then we are Yeah, so on the first question, I'll give you two parts. Uh, our first 10 customers were literally our friends' companies. So that's non-scalable, but an easy way to get 10 companies in the door. Um, 
we did go live publicly and had a website, had an onboarding flow, like I said, about a year after raising our money and about a year and a half after starting. And our first 100 customers there came in all through basically PR. So we had done some articles announcing what we're doing. Folks came to the website. And so those two pieces, word of mouth and uh, content, PR, articles, things I write, things I contribute, continue to be our biggest drivers of growth. It works for our business because every single company relates to our problem, right? It's kind of unique to be in, but literally every company needs payroll in some way, as long as they have employees. So we can do very mass market, very um, ubiquitous type kind of storylines and coverage um, versus a company that might be only serving a specific niche audience. But I'm happy to unpack more of our go-to-market with you afterwards. And then in terms of um, second question, again, I got caught up in the first summary was the, what was the second question? Oh, trust. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the thing where timing helps. Like, Gusto 15 years ago would have never worked because people didn't trust web browsers. That's one. And then two, what we can control is that we never had a beta. We never had a pilot. We never, ever, ever took for granted the fact that someone is giving us this incredible responsibility to get paid on time so they can make rent or set up health insurance so their kid gets sick and get coverage correctly. And so that becomes just a part of the DNA of the company in how we build software and how we build products and how we hire. Um, it's something that you know, I'm happy to talk about in the company, but it's kind of in our DNA. Like we take upon it as this, as this privilege. And so uh, that plus being available. I mean, I think some tech companies bias too much to say, hey, software fixes everything. It's magical. Just you know, go use it and you'll be happy. No, people can always call us. They can always chat with us. They can always email us. And we're always going to be here to help. And I think having that combination of great software and great people is what made people more comfortable. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Everyone give it up for Josh. Thank you for coming. Okay.